Well, hey there. How are you? It's Kim Constable. Welcome to the Strong and Sculpted podcast, the podcast by me, Kim Constable, also known as the Sculpted Vegan about all things strong and of course, all things sculpted. So what are we going to talk about this week? Well, this week we are going to talk about something that I get very very rattled about sometimes. <laughs> Not really rattled, but like um, anyone who's in any of my groups, especially my 18-month group, will know what I'm going to say here. Because whenever this subject comes up, I usually go, and they all go, uh, oh, you're going to get it now. Oh, she's going to give it to you now. They all know what's going to come. Um, and it's, well, it's not really that bad. But today we're going to talk about uh, what I love to call food fads, okay? Food fads. What are food fads? Well, food fads are things like um, intermittent fasting, keto, paleo, FODMAP, uh, you know, no carbs before bedtime, it, whatever, <laughs> whatever food fad is currently sweeping the world, uh, it kind of gets my goat up a little bit because, you know, even though, yes, they have their purpose in the world and whatever else, there are other reasons that I don't believe that food fads are a good thing. And I'm just going to, you know, I'm just going to give it to you straight here. You may listen to this and go, right, that's it. I hate her that I bet she's just completely ruined. I'm, I'm an intermittent faster and how dare she say these things. So people tend to get really upset sometimes by what I say because, I, you know, I have strong opinions about things. But here's the thing about opinions, right? They're like assholes. Everybody has one. So just because I have an opinion on something does not mean that that opinion is gospel, does not mean that what you are doing is wrong. It just means that this is my personal belief. So take what you will from it. Leave the rest. I may say something that makes you go, oh, that's interesting. I never thought about that. I may, I may say something that makes you go, oh my God, you've completely transformed my view on this and now I'm going to change. And then I, you may just listen to it and go, yeah, you know, Kim, you're really entertaining and I love your scary witch voice and you swear like a sailor, but I don't really believe in what you said and I'm just going to rock on with my bad self. And so, and, and I encourage you to form your own opinion about what I'm going to say, but you know, food fads do send me in a little bit of a tailspin, I have to be honest. So I'm just going to lay it all out for you today and give you my opinion opinion of what I think that, you know, food fads are, why I don't believe they're a good thing per se, what you should do instead. And of course, I'm going to give you some stories, some strategies and all that other good stuff in between. Okay, are we good? Excellent. But before we get started, you know what I'm going to say. Don't forget to leave your review on the Sculpting, oh, I was going to say the Sculpting Shred, on the uh, Strong and Sculpted podcast. Uh, don't leave it on our website in order to be in with a chance of winning a $1,500 Sculpt and Shred program or any other program of your choice. Even the Butt Camp, which is coming up, releasing on the 11th of June. There's much excitement about the eight-week Butt Camp. It's all about sculpting and shredding juicy glutes, of course. Launches uh, 11th of June. If you want to be in with a chance of winning a copy of that or any of our other programs, Programs, simply leave a review on the podcast. You can leave four per month. You can leave one on each episode. Then screenshot the review, send them to me on Instagram. That is part of the process. And you could be chosen to win a program of your choice. Um, we choose one every single month. We're about to choose May's. Uh, so you will be in with a chance of winning at the end of June. You have four chances in June. You could be the winner in July. Uh, so make sure that you leave the podcast wherever, sorry, leave the review wherever you listen to the podcast. <laughs> Okay, so let's get started talking about keto, paleo, intermittent fasting, FODMAP, all of those things. I'm not going to specifically talk about each and, and, and every of those things, but I'm going to, to give you my general opinion on them. Okay, so let me tell you about um, a story, first of all. It's almost like settling. And as somebody said to the other day, whenever Kim goes, well, first, let me tell you a story that they all go... <sighs> Ah, it's almost like settling in with your feet up and a cup of tea, you know, whenever your mum would have read you a bedtime story, a bedtime story years ago. But I think that stories are really good for um, reiterating a point and for having people, you know, to make your point. You know, people are more engaged when you tell stories. That's why I love to tell stories. Okay, so let me start with a story. So, um, I remember whenever I first heard about, do you remember years ago? I don't know how old you are, but I am 41, okay? And so Dr. Atkins, I think he's been around for a long time. I'm pretty sure he's dead now, actually. But he came up with the Atkins diet, I think, whenever I was in my 
early 20s. So I think I probably was about, well, that's when I first heard about it. That's whenever it first went mainstream. I'm sure Dr. Atkins was teaching the Atkins diet for many, many, many years. And I'm sure the Atkins diet actually was probably not devised for weight loss. I'm sure it was devised for, you know, some other purpose for which it was, you know, uh, designed. But it probably, a side effect was weight loss, which is why it probably became so mainstream. So what is the Atkins diet? Where it's basically a keto diet, right? You don't eat any carbs or you eat like minimal, minimal, minimal carbs, okay? So of course, I heard about the Atkins diet, right? And instead of, you know, as you do, doing your research, which I always recommend and finding out what actually is this thing, I did, made the fundamental mistake that I always teach everybody else not to do, which was I heard one small piece of data in an enormous sea of data, which was probably available had I gone looking for it. And I took that one piece of data and I made that gospel and I followed that one piece of data, which was my understanding of something which actually wasn't probably even the full understanding, if you get what I mean. So here's what happened. So I was in my early 20s and um, I you know, was fond of drinking and eating and, you know, all of those things, partying as you do whenever you're in your early 20s. And I was never huge. Like, I was never, you know, very overweight. Um, But I definitely grew up in a family that did a lot of fat shaming. And so I've always been, you know, terrified of being overweight. And so I... I heard about Dr. Atkins and the keto diet. And I heard, you know, if you ever heard of the Atkins diet, you know, I can't, I think it was one of my friends said to me, it's like, oh my God, such and such did the Atkins diet and they lost, you know, 10 pounds and such and such did the Atkins diet and they lost 15 pounds and someone else lost seven pounds in a week. And I was like, oh my God. So I was hearing all these incredible stories, right? About, you know, people losing, you know, weight really, really fast. And it's almost like whenever you hear about someone making money really quickly, right? Whenever someone goes, oh my God, did you hear about this? Such and such. Like whenever those pyramid selling schemes came out years ago, I remember whenever, you know, everyone used to go to meet things about them and stuff. I was quite young. I think I was in my early teens. And I was hearing about these pyramid selling schemes and all you had to do was invest X amount of money and then you 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 could make this and this. And we were heard about these people making thousands and thousands. So it's the kind of the same. Whenever someone hears about someone making loads of money, right? And they go, oh my God, yeah. And she's, you know, made X amount of millions and X amount of millions. And suddenly our ears perk up and we go, oh, like easy money. Okay. Easy diet makes our ears open in the same way as easy money does, right? Get rich quick or get thin quick. If you're in the market of get rich quick or get thin quick, you are going to make a million. Uh, Unless, and then they'll find out that it doesn't actually work. (laughs) So... Anyway, I digress. So anyway, I heard about the Atkins diet, right? So 10 pounds in one week, lost 15 pounds, whatever. And I was like, I, I need to hear about this voodoo magic. What is this voodoo magic? I need some of this because I was obviously, you know, always looking to lose a bit of weight. And I, so I heard Atkins diet, you don't eat any carbs. That's all I heard. Atkins diet, don't eat carbs. I didn't educate myself on what carbs were on slow carbs, on low carbs, on what carbs were acceptable. Years later, whenever I got into bodybuilding or whatever, and I love to do research, I bought a book by Dr. Atkins. So I am now actually fully versed on the Atkins diet, and he does not advocate no carbs. He just advocates minimal carbs or slow carbs. You're eating very, very low carbohydrate, you know, vegetables and stuff, which is kind of what I do whenever I'm prepping now, you know, eating green vegetables and all that kind of stuff. All I heard was no carbs. So I remember thinking, oh my God, this is amazing. I get to eat all of the foods that I really, really want to eat without without feeling guilty about it. And I'm just going to lose loads of weight. That's what I heard when I heard Atkins diet, right? I heard I can eat all the shit of the day as long as it doesn't have carbs and I'm going to lose loads of weight. So I remember being really excited. It was after a weekend's probably heavy drinking when I was in my early 20s. And I remember I decided I was going to get up in the morning and I was going to start the Atkins diet on Monday morning. I remember I got out of bed extra early because I I wanted to, I, I was a carnivore at the time. I, I ate meat and I thought, I'm going to cook myself some bacon and some sausages and eggs. And I'm going to have bacon, sausages and eggs for breakfast, but nothing with carbs, just bacon, sausages and eggs, right? Breakfast of champions, right? Not. So in Belfast, we call it heart attack on a plate. That's what a, we call an Ulster fry, right? An Ulster fry is where literally you fry everything. You fry the bread, you fry the bacon, you fry the sausages, you fry the eggs, you fry the tomato. Everything's fried and then it's put on your plate. So it's basically a heart attack on a plate. So I decided that I was going to um, to do this. So I get up in the morning and I cook myself like three rashers of bacon and three sausages or something and, you know, two eggs. And I sat down at the table and I ate them. Now, it did feel a wee bit weird to not have like any carbs, any toast or whatever 
whatever. But to me, carbs in those days were just, you know, potatoes, pasta, you know, bread, rice, all that kind of stuff. I hadn't considered, you know, carbs and vegetables. I did know the vegetables had carbs and fruit had carbs and that kind of stuff. So anyway, I just decided that I would cut out all carbs. So then I went into work um, and I I can't remember what I brought with me for my lunch or whether I was just getting lunch. I don't even think I was, I was a Marlene 20 so I don't think I was like prepared bringing lunch with me to work. So anyway, I got into work and I had my coffee and whatever. And then it came to lunchtime or snack time or whatever. And and I I can't remember, but I, I know I had my lunch and I had no carbs. And I think I went out to the sandwich shop as we normally would. And I was like, just give me the filling, but no bread. And so, you know, I had my car, had my, my lunch, or whatever. But all I was really eating was protein. I was just eating meat at the time and eggs. Um, and I don't, I can't even remember. I might have had like egg mayo or something with like just some meat on the side. I wasn't even having any vegetables. I was literally just thinking that this was just all you had to eat was protein. Okay, protein and fat. Fat was fine too. So, so that came to lunch. So after lunch, I realized that I had a, a bit of a headache and I was like, oh, my energy was really low and I felt like a real slump and I was like, oh, this isn't pleasant. I really, I'm not feeling good at all. But I managed to make it through to dinner time and I had, you know, my dinner and again, and by this time the joy had gone out of my day, you know, it was like, you know, I woke up in the morning so excited to have bacon and eggs for breakfast because obviously bacon and eggs was, you know, full of fat and whatever. That was a, that was a, a, a weekend food. That wasn't healthy food. That's what you didn't eat when you're on a diet. So I was like, I can't believe I get to eat this food when I'm on a diet. So I get up, you know, or that night I went home and I can't even remember what I had for dinner, but I was like, seriously, I just cannot face another plate of meat and eggs and whatever it was I was eating, you know, and, I, and all the joy had gone out of my food. And I remember having dinner and by this point, I had a searing, stonking headache. I mean, a really bad headache. I was so low. I felt, no, you know, low in energy. I felt nauseous. And I, I usually go to the gym in the evening and I didn't have any, you know, energy to go to the gym. I was like, this is absolute bullshit. And so I got to about eight o'clock that night and I thought, I can't cope with feeling this way. I just cannot cope with feeling this way. There's no diet is worth this. So I remember going into the kitchen, making myself two big bits, of, you know, two pieces of toast or probably maybe four pieces of toast, like a binged on toast, you know, loads of dripping with butter and at the toast and then felt a million times better about half an hour later. So I was like, okay, that was my brush with the Atkins diet. And really the bad feeling just was not worth it. Ain't doing that again, right? So here's, so what's, what's the point I'm trying to make? The point was that my goal was to lose weight. Okay. So that was my goal, but I hadn't gone, Oh, I have this goal. I'm going to lose seven pounds and I'm going to lose it in seven weeks. And this is my macros and calories, whatever. No, none of that. I was just like, yeah, I want to lose diet. This is the get thin, the get thin quick scheme. And I had heard that Dr. Atkins was like the fastest way to do it, right? This was the, the fastest way. It was all over the news. Everyone was using it and whatever. And so I just took one data point from the Atkins diet, which was don't eat any carbs, you know, didn't do any investigation into the diet and just went hell for leather for one full day, completely put myself off it, destroyed my experience of it, and then gave it all up in the end. So the point is, or the the thing I want to tell you is like fad diets, right? Fad diets are the ones that reach the media and the mainstream. So fad diets are the ones that we hear about because the media you know, grabs hold of them because maybe a celebrity has done them. And I think this is what happened with the Atkins diet. All the celebrities were doing the Atkins diet. And so, of course, the media is always interested in what the celebrities are doing. So then they start writing about it. And then, of course, once the celebrities start doing it, then it starts trickling down to the normal people. And of course, then they completely fuck it up like I did, you know. It's like, I'm sure the celebrities have all like, you know, personal trainers and and personal chefs. And they have, you know, not that I want to talk because I have chef too. But, you know, they have these people who are designing these diets and creating their food and making sure that their health is, is high priority and their bodies are nourished and they're moving you know steadily towards the goal but all the media hears is Dr. Atkins, Atkins diet, keto. And then it like, you know, and it probably makes up a lot of crap about it, puts it out in the mainstream. Everybody hears about the fad diet and everybody jumps on the bandwagon, right? Jumps on the bandwagon. They all go, I'm going to do the Atkins diet. And of course, they're, you know, the results are fantastic for some people who actually do it correctly. Then for other people, they're like, I get stinky breath and a headache and I couldn't sleep and I felt atrocious and I had no energy and, and you know, all that kind of stuff. And the reason why you get stinky breath, I'm going to talk about it in a minute as well. But um, so, but, you know, and the thing about it is, right, we all hear about these bad diets. We hear about the celebrities doing these diets. We, we, 
we we see it in the media and so everyone jumps on the bandwagon because the truth is that long term sustainable plans like the 18 month sculpt and shred or even you know even my like four week program it's a it's a specific i have lots of four week programs the jailhouse shred the four week shred we have the 12 week shred we have we're now have the eight week butt camp these programs have start middle and end right they have like a they are a, they are a, a a plan which is designed to be done for four weeks or eight weeks or 12 weeks it's not a four week plan that's designed to be done indefinitely. There's a start and an end point, okay? It's not a fad. It's a program that you follow for a specific amount of time to lose a specific amount of body of body fat or achieve a specific goal for yourself, right? That's what a lot of people do the four-week shred, not because they want to lose body fat. They do the four-week shred because they want to prove to themselves that they can. So some people have different goals than others. But, but the... The reason why you know the four week shred or the sculpt the eighteen more right the eighteen months let's talk about that the reason why the eighteen month sculpt and shred isn't sweeping the world even though veganism is massive at the minute and I am like the bit the largest online vegan bodybuilding company in the world do you know how many articles I've had written about me none <laughs> none do you know why because it's not sexy right. It's not sexy. It's not newsworthy. You know, it's like everyone's just plugging in their macros, planning their food, going to the gym, doing the same training, coming home. Changes are are sustainable. They're, you know, gradual. They're, you know, like, of course, like if you look at some people, you know, from the start to the end of the program and you go, well, this is her at the start. Now, this is her at the end. People are like, holy shit. Wow. Like she looks amazing. And then that becomes, you know, and then it's like, you know, mother of four transforms her body. But, you know, using the 18-month program, but do you think anyone's going to go, oh, wow, I want to do that program? No, because it's not a get-thin-quick program. It's not a get-rich-quick get scheme. It's a long-term sustainable program that works. But the problem is it's not sexy and it's not newsworthy. So the reason why we jump on fad diets. The reason why we we hear about these these programs, the reason why everyone's doing intermittent fasting or keto or paleo or FODMAP or whatever it is that they're doing isn't because these programs necessarily work better than what I would teach in my programs, which is much less sexy and much more boring and much more sustainable in the long term. It's because they are they're reaching the news. And so everyone's jumping on the bandwagon because everyone else is doing them because Margaret down the road's doing them. Margaret's, you know, Margaret's daughter lost 10 pounds and then Margaret's daughter's, you know, s- sister, brother, uncle, aunt or whatever lost 15 pounds. And so everybody goes, oh, well, if they can do it, I can do it too. And everybody jumps on, it, right? That's why it's like TikTok. TikTok in quarantine. Suddenly, everyone's on freaking TikTok because you know, what else are you going to do in quarantine except make TikToks with your family? So now, you know, now Aunt Jemima, who's 83, has a TikTok account, okay? So that's... That's basically what that's basically what um, these fad diets are, okay? They're just something that sweeps the world and everyone jumps on them, which doesn't necessarily mean that they work, right? Because here's the here's the thing. There are no quick fixes, right? There's no cheats and there's no quick fixes to getting what you want. There really is not. And this reminds me of a story like, um, so years ago, whenever I was younger, my I had a I had a Springer Spaniel called Molly. Okay, so my stepdad Ian absolutely loved loved him. Still love him, um, even though he's not married to my mother anymore. He's remarried to my stepmom. See, that, that's an interesting story. People say to me, "I'm like, oh yeah, my stepdad and my stepmom are coming to dinner," and people go, "You're your stepdad and your stepmom," and you can see them like trying to figure it out. And I'm like, "Yeah, I have loads of parents. My mom's been married three times. My dad's been married and divorced twice. My stepdad's been married twice. My stepmom has just." divorced her third husband, people are like, oh my God, like you have more parents than you could swing a dead cat at, which is true. I have the te- most terrible sayings for a vegan, don't I? Like you could skin a cat and swing a dead cat. And Anyway, they're just sayings. Don't make it mean anything about me. So anyway, um, my stepdad, whenever we were younger, um, came home one day, he woke up and he said to my mom, I'm going to get a dog today. And mom was like, you're going to get a dog? And he apparently, he like, he, I don't know, we didn't really have the internet then. So he opened, it was a newspaper, I think. And he was like, I'm going to get that dog. And it was a Springer Spaniel. So he arrived home with this Springer Spaniel, right? And we called her Molly. And she was the most amazing dog. And Molly, for Molly and I, it was love at first sight. I fell in love with Molly. I was only 19. And I was riding horses competitively at the time. So I was actually, 
what I mean, yeah, it was in university. I think I was 18. I was actually 18. I was in university. I was riding horses competitively. Um, and so Molly used to, I trained her from a very, very young age to come out with me. So I had two competition horses that I rode um, to quite a high level up to, uh, well, Ross was a three-star eventer, three-star eventing uh, level. And so I um, had two horses that I rode to high competition level. I used to ride them out every day. So we either rode out hacking, riding out means that you go hacking on the road for exercise, or I used to school them. So we had a, a school, a sand paddock, and I used to school them every day and either jumping or dressage or whatever. Or we used to go training in cross country as well. We would go on to different cross country courses and whatever. And the reason I'm telling you this is because Molly used to come everywhere with me. Now, in the beginning, whenever I rode out in the road, it was quiet country roads. If a car came, I had to teach Molly. I had to say, get in, get in, get in. And I car carried a big, long lunge whip, okay, which is a really long um, lunge whip, but not for the horse. I carried it just so I could, um, so I could show Molly where I wanted her to go to get in behind the horse. So Molly very quickly after, you know, many, many, many hours and days and weeks and months became used to the fact of when a car came and I said, Molly, get in. She got in behind the horse and she stayed there just trotting along behind the horse until the car passed. And I would say, good girl, on you go. And then I would send her on and she would then, you know, go and sniff the hedges and whatever. And Molly came with me everywhere. When I went eventing, she came in the horse lorry. She walked across country courses with me several times whenever, um, you know, we were whenever I went to England to work for a show jumper, um, she came with me to England and she came everywhere with me. And because she came everywhere with me and we spent so much time together, Molly was so well trained. I never had to walk her on the roads because I used to ride out the horses every day. And she, right up until, uh, well, she only died a few years ago, actually. She was like really old when she died. But she, um, right up until, I suppose she was with me, uh, right up until I think the kids, I'm trying to think, it was was Jack born when Molly was, I can't remember. I think she died maybe five years ago. So yes, Jack's eight. So I think that she was she was alive then, but I, I never had to walk her. My point is never really had to walk her on the road, but how Molly was trained was whenever I was out on the horses and I would have taught her to get in. And people used to say to me, my God, that dog is so well trained. If we were in the kitchen and I had said, Molly, bed, she would have just gone straight to her bed. Or if I had said, stop begging, she would have stopped begging. Or I said, get down. She got down. Like there was no no, there was no, she never questioned you. She never growled or she never whatever. And that kind of drives me insane whenever people don't know how to train their dogs. And you go, oh, and I said, you could have pat the dog. And the dog goes and growls at you if they're sitting on someone's knee. I'm like, that is not okay. That is that dog telling you that you are, that it is alpha male. Okay. I love my dogs, but a dog should be a dog. A dog is not a human. And any behavioral dogs that children or the, any behavioral problems that dogs have are a result of bad training by humans. Okay. By humans treating the dog like a human instead of treating the dog like a dog. You can love a dog in the way the dog is supposed to be loved by treating it like a dog and making it feel safe. Anyway, don't make me go off on a tangent about dog training. Um, so let's go back. Why is this important? Well, Molly then died and I decided I would get another dog, okay? Now, I didn't have time for another dog. I had four children under the age of eight, okay? And I said to Ryan, I, no, no, yes, Jack was very young. So Molly must have died about eight years ago. So Jack was two and we got Pippa. And I said, Ryan, I want to get a Jack Russell. And Ryan was like, no, we're not getting another dog. You don't even have time to look after the four children as well as like run your yoga business, whatever else I was doing at the time. He's like, well, you do not have time to train a dog. And I was like, it'll be fine. I was like, Kim, I really don't want another dog. I was like, we're going to get a Jack Russell. It'll be fine. So we got a Jack Russell called Pippa. And I had no time to train Pippa. I, like, how, I, just, I just thought that Pippa would just naturally, you know, fall into the way of the family. But the problem was the reason why Molly was such a good dog wasn't because she was a good dog. It's because she had been well trained consistently consistently over many, many, many years of repetitive behavior. So whenever Pippa came into the family, I didn't have time to walk Pippa every day. I couldn't go out for a walk. I couldn't leave the kids at home like I can do now. Anytime, I, anywhere I went, the kids had to come with me. So if I went out for a walk with the dog, then I had to put the kids in a pram and I had to, I had like, see, if you ever tried to walk four children, it's impossible, okay? It's impossible to walk four children. So I either had to wait for Ryan to come home to walk the dog or, and so in the end, then what I ended up doing was just like riding on the bike and getting her to run along beside me just to exercise her like crazy. She used to bark at the postman. She bit the postman one day. She was such a little shit. She would have snuck upstairs and got on the beds. And our dogs are not allowed on the beds upstairs. They're allowed upstairs. They're just not allowed on the beds. And so she would have, you know, she, and and my she drove me insane because I could not 
train her. And it wasn't the dog's fault. It was my fault because I have I have expectations of how my dogs are allowed to be in the house. And and they're very, very, very happy dogs. But I if I say to my dog, listen, I have so many people in my house every day between my housekeeper and my chef and my kids. And I'm working from home and Ryan's in and out and we have people coming and going all day. I need to be able to say, if I say bed to the dog, I need that dog to get in its bed, right? And so <laughs> Pippa would not would not be trained. And it wasn't the dog's fault because I had no fecking time to train her, right? I wanted to get the dog and I was looking for the quick fix. So I ended up shouting at her a lot. And I was like, stop it, right? You know, Pippa, stop that, <laughs> whatever. And she was always barking and yapping. And then we had to like constantly keep her in. And, and oh my God, it was so exhausting, right? It was exhausting. Having Pippa was completely exhausting. So I ended up giving her to my sister. I was like, she went to stay there for a holiday. When well, she went to stay there while we were on vacation and I said to Carol, would it be a bad thing if she never came back? And Carol was like, well, no, because we were going to get a dog anyway. So they were going to get a dog and she had much more time. Her kids were older. They love Pippa. Pippa is still there. She lives there. I love seeing her. She's delighted to see me when I go to my sister's, but she doesn't live with me anymore. And so then we got Buddy, okay? Now, Buddy is a Boston Terrier. Buddy is our current dog. And I, whenever I said to Ryan, I wanted another dog, he was like, no, I'm scarred by Pippa. And I was like, no, this one will be different. I have time. He's like, Kim, you do not have time to train a dog. I was like, I really, really do have time, okay? I promise I do. And whatever. And I and I and so anyway, we got Buddy. And of course, Buddy was a puppy when we got him. So he was shitting and pissing everywhere. And he didn't know how to walk on a lead. And and so we had, you know, all of the initial teething problems. And Ryan's going, ah, you see that bloody dog's out of control. That dog's this. That dog doesn't listen. Now, Buddy, it really is quite pathologically stupid okay there's really no <laughs> there's no other way to describe buddy i swear i think that he has a few less brain cells than he should have he is definitely a sandwich short of a picnic because anyway at the things that that dog does but now we've had buddy two years now he well, he was two in yeah we got him two years ago in january so about just over two years and of course, whenever we first got him, Ryan would go, I ah, you see, you see, the you I told you, and he wanted to prove me wrong, right? That he that I couldn't train the dog. And I was like, Ryan, I this dog, well, I honestly it's like dogs aren't trained overnight. It just takes consistency. Do I have the same amount of time that I had to train Molly? No, but I I just like stop putting pressure on me and just be a little more patient with the dog and it'll be fine. When I say trained, like he wasn't crapping in the house or anything, but he was, you know, um he was just being a puppy, right? And he was just a bit unruly. And, and whatever and so it didn't do what you told him and 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 all those different things and so anyway we were out the other day and we were walking and we walk but Ryan and I walk all the time now and I walk Buddy now Buddy is only two but he does not need a lead Buddy, Buddy has I usually carry a lead with me in case I have to put it on him somewhere but Buddy I have trained Buddy to walk without a lead I trained all my dogs to walk without a lead because I was always out hacking horses and I couldn't have a lead whenever I was on a horse so um, I trained Buddy to walk without a lead for me it was about six months old probably six to eight months old um, and now he's two and he does not need a lead at all so we were out walking the other day with Ryan and I and we were on this busy road normally I don't make him heel beside me the whole time on the road if we're on a, you know quiet roads he, he can walk a little bit in front of me or a little bit behind me and he sniffs and he stops to pee and poop or whatever and that's fine but if we're on a busy road or somewhere then I I want him to heal I want him to stay beside me and so I said to Ryan you know I said oh we went onto this busy road and I said oh I, I think I want Buddy to heal so I called him back I said Buddy come and I said wait so if you say to Buddy wait then he knows to wait beside you. So Buddy came back, he said, call them. And I said, wait. And so he he waited and Ryan and I were just walking and Buddy then, as soon as he heard wait, he went to heel and he stayed there and he went a little bit in front of me and I went, wait. And he dropped back and he went behind me and the rest of the way he walked at heel. And Ryan said, how did you train him to do that? And I said, uh, I, I don't know, just consistency. And he said, but he said, like, it's amazing. He said, you know, he knows that he can run around and go up and down the roads, but yet the minute you tell him to come back, he heals and he waits and he waits for my command, like until I say, good boy, on you go. And when I say, good boy, on you go, then he knows he can run on ahead again. But he's constantly uh, like evaluating when we're walking. He's looking to me. You can see his ears are at me the whole time. You know, he's waiting for me to lead where he goes. But and Ryan said, this could be a really good episode for your podcast. You know, he said, it's a really good metaphor. And I said, in what way? And he said, consistency. He said, you know, buddy is two. He said, I'll give you that. I did not believe that, you know, that dog, you know, he said, I've never seen a dog trained, right? They're not dog people. They never had, well, they had a dog in their family, but it was kind of a yard dog out, out in the back. Whereas my mom used to breed and show dogs. We had 40 or 50 dogs at any one time. She actually got best of breed at Crufts, which is a huge championship here in, um, 
in England, actually. She got it a couple of times. And so we always had 40 or 50 dogs at any one time when we were younger. And so I read a lot of dog training books. I saw my mum training dogs. I saw them train to the gun. I saw, you know, um, all that kind of stuff. So it was very much in my DNA to train a dog. And so Ryan said, I've never seen a dog trained. He said, and I honestly didn't believe that Buddy was trainable. I said, every dog is trainable. And he said, I know, but he's just so unruly. And I said, he's a terrier, so he's a little more energetic, but he's definitely still trainable. You just have to be consistent. I said, it's just consistency. I said, I've, you know, that people ask me, how did you train Buddy off a lead? And I say, well, I just, I kept the lead on him when he was younger. And then closer and closer to home, I began to take the lead off him. I had treats in my pocket. I, you know, asked him to wait. When he waited, I rewarded him. I said, good boy. So he very, he just, dogs are just, you know, they have like a stimulus response pattern, like a Pavlovian link. So you, you know, you reward their, you reward good behavior. And then they learn this is what you want. Pretty soon you don't need to reward them anymore. You just have to say, wait, and they do. And so it made me think, whenever I was planning this podcast, it made me think, this is what it's, like whenever you are dieting <laughs> or whenever you see a food fad that you want to jump on, right? It's not really that that's what it's like, but here's where I'm going with this. Sometimes I'm sure you wonder where the hell my stories are going. <laughs> so here's the thing, okay? There are no cheats or quick fixes when it comes to dog training. Dogs are animals, okay? You cannot train them any faster than they are willing to be trained. Now, of course, you can invest more time and energy in them. You can spend, you know, time. We spent time uh, one evening teaching buddy tricks, right? We taught him in one evening how to sit down, give you his paw, turn around, jump and close the door in one evening just by consistency, consistency, consistency and rewarding good behavior. So there are things that you can do a little faster and the more time you spend, the faster you will get results. I walk with Buddy every day and I walked with him every day to consistently teach him how to heal, how to wait, how to, you know, and how to do all those things that I expected him to do. So the consistency over time has meant that I have a very, very well-trained dog who listens to me most of the time. Some he's a puppy, he's still young, he's not a puppy, he's two, but sometimes he, you know, he gets distracted and he goes off, but that's what dogs do, okay? But most of the time, he's very, very, very um, trained, very well trained and listens to me. And this is exactly what it's like whenever you are working towards a long-term goal for yourself. There are no there are no fi- the quick fixes. There's no cheats, right? See with Buddy, I could, I could, I could yell at Buddy, I could even hit him, and I could make him scared. Okay. So that if I yelled at him or I hit him or I something, and then I, you know, we've all seen these stories of like an angry farmer or something who's been like, you know, yelling at their dog and then the dog's like cowering in the corner. And so the dog learns to be scared very quickly, but I don't want to scare buddy. I want to train him. I want him to do the things because he wants to do them or because he's trained to do them because he's happy to do them. Okay. So there's a difference. You can scare the shit out of your dog and you can beat it, which will make it scared of you. And then it'll make it very, you know, very scared and, and timid and acquiescent. And we've all seen those dogs that have been beaten and they be, they're they very timid and scared for the rest of their lives. Or you can, do, and that, that would be the quick way to do it, to achieve your goal. Or you can invest the time in training them over the long term, which requires effort, which requires hours of walking, which requ- requires oodles of patience, which requires a belief in the future. Like I had with Buddy, I was like, I know that if I just stay consistently on this path, or I have a hypothesis if I stay consistently on this path, that he will probably never be as well trained as Molly, because Molly was a Springer Spaniel, and she was very, very biddable. Uh, when I'm angry with Buddy, sometimes I go, why can't you just be a Spaniel? <laughs> but um, he's not, he's a terrier, and I accept him for who he is. But so my point is that, you know, whenever people jump on, you know, they hear about the Atkins diet or the intermittent fasting diet or the food map, FODMAP or whatever it's called diet. People ask me all the time, what are your thoughts on the FODMAP? I'm like, I don't even know what that is. What is that? And so they all expect that I've heard of all of these things because they, people hear that the celebrities are on these diets and, the cel- and Jennifer Aniston's doing intermittent fasting. So that means I should do intermittent fasting, right? And so we jump on the intermittent fasting crusade without ever really figuring out. And I quite often when I say to people, they say to me, oh, uh, I'm well, I'm doing intermittent fasting. Uh, will this work with your plan? And I go, why are you doing intermittent fasting? And they go, um, uh, because, um, and I'm like, is, you know, what? And they go, well, because I want to lose weight. And I go, yes, but why, why intermittent fasting? And they go, well, uh, well, it just just means that I don't don't eat until lunchtime. I know I understand what it is, but I'm just understanding why you, with your particular goal, have chosen that particular route. 
And do you know 99.9% of the time people can't answer me? They go, well, I don't know. I just heard that it was that it was like, you know, it was good. And my, my friend Molly did it and she got like, or, you know, my, my friend Sarah did it and she she got really good results or my such and such is doing it. And, you know, or my trainer recommended it, but I don't I don't know why. I'm doing it. So people can't tell you why. They can't tell you about the metabolism. They can't tell you about, you know, calorie intake over a 24 period. They can't tell you about your TDEE. They can't tell you about being in a deficit. They can't, they can't give you any scientific reason for their body or for anything that it, it, is as to why they are doing this thing. They just heard that someone else was doing it and it got results. So they decided to jump on the bandwagon, right? But if you don't if you, if you do a patch job on your diet, right, which is kind of what like shouting at a dog is like, right? If you shout at a dog and you beat them, same with children, okay? It's harder to parent children respectfully. P- you know, people say to me, oh, you're such a lazy parent because I do this thing radical unschooling with my kids. And I go, no, no, let me tell you something. It's much easier to yell at your kids or to spank them or to send them to the room or to the naughty step than to actually educate them and talk to them and try on their emotions and feel those emotions as if they were your own. It's very hard to get out of your own way and out of your own process and out of your own emotions to deal with the emotions of this little person. It's much easier to indulge your anger and spank them or shout at them or make them wrong or shame them and send them to the, the than to send them to the room than it is to talk through and figure through an issue and actually teach them how to process and evaluate information to go for a longer term result. Okay. We do this everywhere. We do it with raising our children. We do it with our dogs. We do it with our diets. We do it with everything. We want to slap the band-aid on something. We want to indulge the feeling that we have right now, which is I look in the mirror and I don't like what I see. I can't fit into that pair of jeans. I have an, an event coming up next week that I want to get into that dress for. And therefore, we jump on the fad diet bandwagon with no real idea as to why we're jumping on it, except we want a result. And we've heard that this is the get rich quick scheme or the get thin quick scheme. And that's why we do it. We believe that it will be easier. It's not the only reason why we do it. There are other reasons, which I'll discuss in a minute. You know, of course, some people do go into it mindfully and that's fantastic. Some people, it's not only that they don't go into it mindfully, they just, they don't know what else to do. Okay. So they don't, they don't know, they don't really have any other, it's not like they've evaluated all their options in front of them and gone, okay, I have a Value at all my options, and now I'm going to choose intermittent fasting as my option. No, they just they go. I want to lose weight, and this seems like it would work, so let's give it a whirl. Okay, nothing wrong with that at all. In fact, there's nothing wrong with any reason why anyone chooses any of these diets. I'm just trying to break it down a little bit because I see so many people choosing these over choosing what actually works in the long term, and I want to try and change that a little bit. If that is you, if you're like, oh my god, this is so me, then I'm hoping that this is helping you. Okay, so but being patient, explaining things to your kids, gaining respect takes time. Time, okay, but it's so much more rewarding in the end. So does, you know, finding out what is a macro, what is a calorie, what is my total daily energy expenditure? How can I push myself into a deficit either with calories or with cardio? in order to lose body fat? What is a sustainable amount of body fat that I should lose over time? Okay, one to two pounds a week. Great. So I have 20 pounds to lose. So it's going to take me 10, 15, 20 weeks to lose it. Like all of this information takes time. And then once you even start your diet, then you have to trust. You have to trust that it's actually going to work. There has to be, there's like an element of fear there. There's an element of, holy shit, like, is this actually going to help me achieve my goal? Am I actually losing weight? Do I really look any different in my photos? Because it's not, it's not happening quickly, you don't get like that fast result. You don't, you don't get that, you know, but here's the thing, right? Your, your child does something. You go, Rawr! you shout at your child and your child goes, oh, mommy, I'm really, really sorry. Well, you instantly feel better. You're like, yes, I got a result. I, 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 this thing they did was bad. Now they feel bad. I got a result. I feel better. And now they won't do it again. And so you get, you get like the closure. Okay. You get the closure of the, what you believe to be the closure, but actually, you know, it, it doesn't work. But I, I don't yell at my kids at all, ever. Uh, we don't have any, any punishment in our house. No, no punishment based on fear. Um, Punishment is really just, um, I I want to inf- inflict emotional or physical pain on you so that you will change your behavior in the future, okay? We don't do any of that in our house. And so that's exactly what it's like whenever you are dieting as well. You don't, you know, you want to take a much longer term view, which food fads and these real quick fixes don't do, 
Okay, they don't take a long-term view. But the reason why we don't take a long-term view, well, there's many different reasons, but one of them is, could be, well, we don't have the information, but the other one is also, we just don't want the experimentation. We don't want the process. We don't want the journey. We uh, we want to have our cake and eat it too. We, we, we just want to feel better in the moment. And we want fast results. But unfortunately, fast results is literally a patch job. Okay. It's a patch job. Yes. You may lose some weight quickly. You may, you know, lose, you know, 15 pounds or whatever and and intermittent fasting or, or FODMAP or whatever else may work for you in the long term. You may be like, well, actually Kim, I've been doing this for 15 years and it is absolutely epic and it's, it works for me and I have so much energy and my skin is clearer and I'm, and I'm like, fantastic. I love it when someone finds something that they work that make, you know, that, that they make work for them. But that, that then isn't a fad. That is something that has been, Uh, tried and tested over time in order to get a result. But unfortunately, 99.9% of people are not doing the fad diets over a sustainable long-term period. They're doing them as a quick fix to slap a band-aid on a problem that is going to take much longer than just a, than, you know, a couple of weeks to fix, unfortunately, right? And it's funny because you can't cut out a whole macro group, okay? And, And I think this is another thing that really pisses me off (laughs) about fad diets, like the keto diet, right? So, or the Atkins diet, right? Carbohydrates, don't eat carbohydrates, they're bad. I'm like, fuck me, really? Like, so the mac, you know, what are macros, right? Macros are proteins, carbs, and fats. They are all essential. They're all essential to achieve your long-term fitness and body goals, right? Now, of course, you can manipulate them to suit longer or short-term goals, but you, but you should never cut out a whole, you know, you should never cut out a whole group. Like that's just like, you know, that's like saying, I really want to lose 10 pounds and me saying, well, just chop your leg off. Like if you chop your leg off, you'll be 10 pounds lighter. People are like, oh, but then my body wouldn't work properly. It's kind of like, you know, I want to lose weight. Oh, we just cut out all carbs. Cutting, cutting out all carbs is like cutting off your leg, right? It, it may work for the short term. You may stand on the scale and weigh 10 pounds lighter, but is it really going to be productive for you in the long term for achieving your goals? No, because you're, you know, you're not much use with just one leg. You can't run. You can't, well, you can get a prosthetic limb, but you know what I'm saying, right? Cutting out a whole food group like carbohydrates is just insane as far as I'm concerned. You know, yes, you, you, you know, you can know what the macros are and you can learn about them. And that's what I would encourage you to do, learn about them too, so you can manipulate them, Right. Because here's the thing about carbs. Carbs are necessary for before training and after training to build and repair muscle, okay? I remember Courtney, my assistant, coming into the office one day. It was not, it was the first time we had ever, um, we'd ever worked together. So she she started for me, uh, Courtney's relatively new. She only started with me in February. And I remember we were sitting here in the office and um, Ian, my chef, had, uh, well, she'd gone to collect lunch actually. And so she set the lunch down. She gave me my lunch and then he, he prepares her lunch too. So she set my lunch down and then she gave, got her own lunch. And then I was like, oh, nom, nom, nom. And I was like eating away. It was delicious. And she said to me, uh, do you eat carbs? And I like stopped like fork halfway to my mouth and I looked at her like incredulously and I was like, do I eat carbs? And she went, oh, you don't, do you? Just the way she said it. And I was like, Courtney, I am a carb. <laughs> I was like, you can't grow as much muscle as I have grown in the last four years and not eat carbs. She was like, oh, really? But I thought carbs were bad for like, you know, for, I thought they made you put on weight. I was like, oh my God, no. So anyway, so I started to educate her on carbohydrates, but like, this is such, and I just laughed and I just thought it's such a a common viewpoint. People are like, all we hear is carbs are bad. And then we hear fat is bad and saturated fat is bad. And, you know, and too much protein is bad. Like we hear all of this shit, right? Okay. I'm going to break it all down for you here. So, so here's the thing about carbs, right? Carbs are not bad. Carbs are very, very, very necessary for energy more than anything. You can get energy from protein, okay? But it's not your best choice because protein has other jobs to fill that take priority over using it as an energy source. What do I mean by this? Well, protein is designed to build muscle, to produce the protein-based substances that make muscles contract. So when you're working in the gym and you're overloading your muscles, it'll make them, you know, you want them to contract more so they'll grow bigger and stronger. It also takes your body longer to turn protein into energy 
compared to the quick boost you can get from carbohydrates. So when your body needs energy, like say you're going to train in the gym, okay? You you want to have protein before you train. Yes, because you want your pro- your muscles to build and synthesize, you know, protein faster so that they'll build back stronger. But when, you know, you also want to have carbs because whenever your body needs energy, it first uses glucose from carbohydrates and then it uses fatty acids, also known as fat, right? So fatty acids are, you know, are basically just fat. So that's what your body will use first. Your body will use carbs and then it will use fat, right? And so that's why the people, you know, the Atkins diet in inverted commas works because, um, it, you know, it pushes your body to use fat as energy instead of carbohydrates. And so if there's not a fat coming in um, from your diet, your body will actually uh, break down fat cells into triglycerides, transport them through the bloodstream to the tissues for energy. So that is how you actually burn fat. If you eat in a calorie deficit, your body will burn off fat stores, will break down fat stores into glucose, but it will ra- it would rather use carbohydrates, okay? But your body doesn't use protein. It really does not want to use protein for an- for energy because protein is needed for so many other things in the body. And as long as you consume enough calories from other sources, protein is not turned into energy. So your muscles can use, like I said, fat stores as energy whenever they are resting. But whenever your activity level increases, like if you're training in the gym or you're walking or you're running or you're doing cardio or any of that kind of stuff, then they depend on the glucose that comes from carbs. So your body can use fat stores when you're resting, but it cannot use fat stores when you're training. And many people don't know this. So... um, like the conversion of amino acids into glucose can fill the gap when you're low on other sources of energy. But when protein is used for energy, ammonia is produced as a byproduct. That's why you get stinky breath. And that's why um, you get muscle fatigue if you're exercising. So if you're doing like intense or extended exercise, ammonia can accumulate in your muscles and cause fatigue. Okay. And and you really do not want that to happen. And that's why you kind of have that acidy smell. You know that like that acidy ammonia smell that people get whenever in the keto diet. I don't know whether you've ever done it or not, but it really is quite rotten. Um, but the thing about it is as well, if you're if you force your body to use protein as energy, then you also deplete the protein needed to repair and restore muscles. So people ask me about intermittent fasting and about keto and all this kind of stuff. And you say they want to use keto whenever they're building muscle. I'm like, keto is so against building muscle. It's not even funny. And your body needs more muscle so that your body can raise its metabolism because muscle is very muscly. Muscle is very calorie hungry. The more muscle you have, the more calories your body requires, the more fat your body will burn for energy when resting. Okay. Are you with me here? So that's why you always want to build muscle in your body. But in order to build muscle, you need carbohydrates to build muscle. That's why we talk about timing your carbohydrates around your training. Eat carbs before you train and carbs after you train because the carbs before you train will be converted into glucose, give your muscles energy to lift more and work harder. And then they will be depleted of glycogen through the training. So the glycogen, the the glucose you ate through the carbs before you trained is depleted during training. And then the carbs that you eat directly after training will be converted into energy, fed into the muscles, and your body will use that along with the protein that you eat to build and repair more muscle tissue faster, right? So this is why you should never cut out a carb group. Carbs are, uh, not a carb group, sorry, a macro group. They're all really important. Carbs, proteins, and fats. Protein for, you know, building and repairing the, you know, the body and muscle tissue and and all of it. So basically your body breaks protein down into individual amino acids and then it builds them back up again. So your body is constantly, um, your metabolism is basically your body breaking things down and building things back up again. So um, whenever you eat something, your body catabolizes it, right? It breaks it down and then it m- metabolizes it again and it and it create, builds it up into something else. So that's what happens with your food. Whenever you digest food, your body breaks the food down into nutrients. Then it takes all those nutrients and it builds it back up into something else, like, you know, m- things that are needed for your muscles or your tissues or your digestive system or your eyes or your hair or whatever. So your body is constantly breaking things down and building them back up. That's actually what your metabolism is. A lot of people don't know what, what metabolism is. That is what your metabolism is. It's your body breaking down everything that you consume, everything that goes into it, and building it back up again into the the things that it needs in order to make your body stronger, fitter, and faster. Your body needs all of the macro groups. It needs the carbs, the proteins, and the fats, and it needs them in a timely manner. So the reason why I'm so against the likes of intermittent fasting is because 
um, whenever you fast at night, your body is um, is your body slows everything down. So fasting, we all understand what fasting is. Whenever you whenever you fast, your body uh, slows down your metabolism because whenever you're in a fasted state, your body doesn't want to continue burning calories at the rate at which it is capable because it doesn't know how long the fast is going to last. Now, of course, it knows if you go to sleep every night that you're, you know, that you're going to wake up in the morning because your body has a, um, uh, I can't think of the word, there's a, a homeostatic norm, okay? Your body has a homeostatic norm and understands you go to sleep at a certain time, you wake up at a certain time, you will fast through the night. So it has a certain, has certain data points, okay? Um, that you're not going to be fasting for several days or whatever. So it doesn't need to slow anything down, but it does slow things down when you're sleeping because you're sleeping, you're resting. There's there's no uh, energy output. There's no energy coming in. Everything is very, very slow. So when you wake up in the morning, your metabolism is naturally slow, okay? Now, what burns fast? What burns fat, right? What am I always preaching? This is a question for you to consider. What am I always preaching that burns fat? Your metabolism, Okay. Your metabolism, when it is fast and roaring along like a steam train, burns fat. How does it burn fat? It it breaks down fat cells. It, you know, you you have a lot of muscle, hopefully from training hard, and or you're building muscle and you're exercising. So your body metabolizes fat, breaks it down into triglycerides, and then it um, feeds it through to the to the body into the muscles as energy. Okay. So whenever you wake up in the morning, your metabolism is slow. If your goal is to burn body fat then and to build muscle, you want to speed up your metabolism in the morning. You don't want to slow it down or you don't want to keep it slow. If you don't eat until lunchtime, then your metabolism stays slow. So I know many people and they get up in the morning and they go and they they go for, you know, they do the cardio and then they go to the gym and then they don't eat until lunchtime. And I'm like, you are so working against your goals. You want to wake up in the morning, you want to feed your body, you want to feed a protein-rich meal of 30 grams worth of protein within 60 minutes of waking up so that you can boost your metabolism. Eating 30 grams of protein within 60 minutes of waking up boosts your metabolism by up to 20% for the entire day. For the entire day day. That, I mean, so your body start, your metabolism ramps up and revs up and your body starts burning more calories. If you don't eat until lunchtime, you're, you're missing out on all of that calorie burn. Now you may say, well, Kim, I've been doing intermittent fasting for a while and I've lost loads of body fat. Well, the reason why you've lost loads of body fat is simply because you've reduced your calorie intake. Because if you're only eating between the hours of say 1 p.m. and 9 p.m. or 1 p.m. and 8 p.m. or whatever it is, then you, you have limited time to get the calories in. So usually what happens with intermittent fasting is people literally have just cut out one meal. Whenever you cut out one meal, you will lose body fat. I decided to do intermittent fasting years ago and I didn't know it was called intermittent fasting, but I had put on a little bit of body fat whenever um, my kids were in school and I was working, um, trying to set up the Work at Home Moms Network and two of the boys, um, the, I, my two oldest boys went to a Rudolf Steiner school for a few years when they were younger. And so anyway, I had to go and I usually pick them up at 12.30. So I had, I think I had Maya, I had someone to help me look after Maya at the time. And so I had the morning free and I realized I put on a bit of body fat. So I thought, well, I don't really have time to diet or train. Like the only time I'd ever really trained properly and calorie, counted calories and everything at this point was after Maya was born and I had gone on a calorie controlled diet and I had been running every day. I didn't do any weight training. I just ran on a treadmill and I counted my calories. I was only eating 1400 calories a day. I had 10 pounds to lose and I lost the 10 pounds in seven weeks. And that was it. But it was hard bloody work, you know, um, doing it. And so that was the only time I'd ever actually been on a calorie controlled plan. And Maya uh, so, so anyway, at this point, I realized I wanted to lose a bit of body fat. So I decided I would just not eat breakfast. So I decided that I would only have coffee in the morning. I would not eat breakfast and I would not eat until after I picked up the kids at 12.30. And so basically I wasn't eating until one o'clock. So I cut out breakfast. Now, I didn't eat any more during the rest of the day. I just had lunch at one o'clock and then I had whatever else I had later on. I had dinner and whatever, and then I went to bed. So I did start to drop body fat and I was like, oh my God, this really works, this not eating in the morning. But what I realized years ago, years later, was that it wasn't the not eating in the morning that worked. That wasn't what caused my body to drop body fat. It was the reduced calories. 
So I had cut out my breakfast, which maybe would have been three, four hundred calories. I'd cut out three hundred, three to four hundred calories a day out of my diet. That's what caused my body to lose body fat. It wasn't not eating breakfast. Like, do you see the difference? Does intermittent fasting work? Yes. But intermittent fasting doesn't work. Not eating till lunchtime doesn't work. Cutting out four, three or four hundred calories out of your diet every day works. That's what causes the calorie deficit. And you can do that while still eating in the morning. You could just cut, if you had four meals a day, you could shave 100 calories off each meal and you would still lose weight because it's not the not eating in the morning that causes you to lose weight. It's the not eating the 400 calories in the morning that causes you to lose weight. So this is why I'm kind of, you know, I'm not against intermittent fasting, but I'm against people believing that it's the intermittent fasting that works and not truly being at cause with the fact that it's just the fact that they have cut calories out of their diet that makes a difference, okay? So, you know, just to go back to my original point, fast fixes, fad diets, like it's not that they don't work because they do, but let's just be really clear about why they work, okay? Atkins works because it forces your body to, or the keto works, it forces your body to use fat as energy, okay? So, and also you're usually cutting calories out of your diet when you're not eating a lot of carbs. So, but, but the, you know, that is how it works. It forces your body to use fat as energy. Okay. So there's not a lot of energy, there's not a lot of energy being stored as, um, as fat store. You know, intermittent fasting works because you're cutting three to 400 calories out of your day. I have no idea what the FODMAP is. It's something to do with not eating nightshades or something or eating special things. Paleo as well. A lot of, I know a lot of paleo, which I think is like a very meat-based diet, but I think there's like a vegan paleo as well. And I can't, I'm not really even sure what paleo is, but I do hear people go, oh, have you ever heard, heard have you tried the paleo diet? Like people write to me all the time on Instagram and they go, oh, can I just get your opinion on the such and such diet? And I write back and I go, sorry, I have no idea what that is. And they go, oh, really? And they, they was like, you're a fitness influencer and you haven't heard of this. I'm like, no, because here's what you'll find about most in, most fitness influencers. We just eat really healthy, wholesome food and we train really hard and we do cardio and we don't follow fads. Like you won't find any professional bodybuilder doing a any kind of fad diet ever if they're a professional, okay? A lot of newbies will try different things like that. But if they're a professional, you won't find them doing it. I've done juice fasts. I've done intermittent. I've done keto. I've done them all, okay, over the years. And let me tell you, the only thing that has ever worked for me is like training the dog. Consistent effort over time. That's all that works. Is it boring? Yes. Is it sexy? No. Like, does it require you to, to develop discipline and new habits and all? Yes. But let me tell you, how many times do you actually want to go out and walk your dog? Like, whenever you're out there, you're like, oh, yes, it's really nice. Like, I'm recording this podcast, right? It's, it's 8.40 at night. Now, luckily in Belfast, it's really bright in the summer here, but I'm going to go home here and walk the dog. Do I really want to go home and walk the dog? No, but I'm going to go and do it because the dog needs a bloody walk and he needs a good walk and I enjoy the consistency. I'm different, doing different training patterns with him at the minute and I, I'm enjoying that consistency. So I'm enjoying the effects of what I'm doing. So, you know, food prepping is boring and and eating and, and training and cardio and all those things, they're boring. But over time, what you learn is not to get excited by the new thing. You learn to get excited by, not excited, but you you learn to um, enjoy the pain. You learn to to, it feels worse to not do it than it does to do it. If I got into bed tonight knowing that I hadn't walked, buddy, I would feel worse than than the effort that it takes to go and do it. And once you reach that point, you know you've won. I see this in my groups all the time. People, you know, the the ones who struggle with their weight all the time, the ones who can never truly achieve their goals are the ones who are going, has anyone heard of this program? Or has anyone ever heard of this? Or, oh, and you know, I, I just got some testing done and it says that, you know, my body doesn't process carbs well. It, you know, it, it only processes fat. And I think I'm going to give this a go. And these are the ones who, whenever you're the kind of person who gets excited by the new and shiny thing, you're never going to achieve your long-term goal because you're, only, you're always going to jump 
to the next exciting thing and the next exciting thing and the next exciting thing, you know? Now, if the exciting thing is moving you towards your goal, so like, for example, we do a lot of shreds, right? We do a lot of shred competitions and a lot of people are like, you know, oh my God, should I, you know, should I do this? I run, I'm in the 18 month program, like we're releasing this new butt camp program can be used as a shred or a build, completely up to you. And a lot of un- different people have written to the coaches and said, I don't know whether I should do this or not. And the coaches have said, well, what is your goal? Well, my goal is to get to 23% body fat. What's your body fat now? 29%. Well then, yeah, absolutely. This is a great shed for you, shred for you to do because it's moving you closer towards your goal. And they're like, oh, I'm like, but I just thought I needed to stay consistent. And they're like, well, this is you staying consistent. You're consistently moving in the direction of your goal. Your goal is to lose body fat. So, so going on an eight-week program that will help you to lose, you know, go from 29 to 23% body fat is phenomenal. That's exactly what you should be doing. But I think that sometimes we're not clear, whereas then you get the ones who are who, but so that's different, okay? But then you get the ones who join the shreds and they go, they go, oh, this is going to be my savior. And then they fall off the wagon. And then they go, oh, this one's going to be my savior. And then they fall off the wagon. And so, you know, but you have to see a program that you're doing is moving you towards your goal. But you have to be clear on what that goal is. And if your goal is to get down to 23% body fat and you're 29% body fat and there's an eight-week, you know, shred butt camp program coming up and you want to have juicy glutes, then yes, absolutely do that. If that's not your goal and you're already like 17, 18, 19, 20% body fat and you're like, no, I'm really looking to build muscle, then do not shred. Do not shred. If you want to do the butt camp, do it. But, you know, I'm speaking to all you guys in my programs because I know you all listen to this podcast. So I'm basically helping you with your decision. But do it, but do it as a build, okay? Or do it at maintenance macros. Or, you know, don't do it as a shred if you don't need to shred. Like, if your goal is to build, then by all means, do it as a build. And I know the competition is is attractive. We're offering a $10,000 um, first prize for the person who makes the biggest transformation. But, like, the biggest transformation is not always the biggest fat loss or who's the most shredded, right? It's who has transformed their glutes or transformed their body the most. And if you're already low body fat, that does not mean mo- losing more body fat. That can mean trans- Transforming in a different way. So you just have to be really, really clear on what your goal is. So, I mean, so let's sum all this up, okay? Let, let's pull all this round in a circle. So, achieving a long term fitness goal really isn't about cutting out food groups or adhering to strict rules, right? It's about knowing how to manipulate the variables to suit your goals. And what I have found is most people who jump on fad diets, right? They want one of three things, okay? So, see if you can relate to these. So, the first one is they're generally unhappy with their weight, okay? Now, when I say generally, I mean over a long time. (laughs) They've been unhappy with their weight over a long time. Like they're generally as in always unhappy with their weight and they are addicted to the short burst of happiness they get when they try something new. It's like, oh, intermittent fasting, maybe this is the thing that's going to help me achieve my goal. Oh, no, 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 FODMAP, that maybe that's, oh, that's it. This is it. And you know these people, right? Because they're like, I'm on this new diet and it's amazing. And you're like, well, you're not on a new diet last week and it was amazing. No, no, but this is, this is new. No, this one's, this one is going. This one, this one's going to work this time. This one is amazing. And such and such did it. She lost X amount and such and such did it. And she lost X amount. And then you meet the next time. You're like, hey, how's that diet going? You're like, oh yeah, it didn't really work for me, but I'm doing this new diet now and this is amazing. Okay. You, not you, by the way, these other people, we all know, you know, those other people who do this, not you, not me. No, the other people, okay? It's the other people that do this. Um, number two, uh, they are impatient and they want fast results and they haven't developed discipline. It kind of goes hand in hand with number one. <laughs> but like, how many times have you been like, I just can't be arsed to do the work in the long term? And I've heard that this is the get rich quick scheme. Just think of fad diets as the get rich. They're the pyramid selling schemes of the fitness world. <laughs> These people want fast results. It's like people who want to earn fast cash. If it sounds like it's too good to be true, it probably is. <laughs> um, number three, they genuinely don't know how to achieve their goals and are looking for something that works. And unfortunately, all they hear about in the media is the quick fixes. So there's a lot of people fall into this category, okay? You gen, you really are looking for something that works. You really do have a goal that you want to achieve, right? Uh, but you actually, like me, whenever I started, you know, the Atkins diet or whatever, I said, oh, I'm just going to cut out, you know, a, you know, a breakfast out of my diet or whatever. It was that I genuinely, I wanted something and I didn't know 
how to achieve it. And I wasn't, I didn't want it that much to really go deep into the research. It wasn't like whenever I started training like for the stage and I was like, okay, this is science now. No, I need to know all of the information. It was kind of like, yeah, I want to lose a bit of weight. Well, I'm really busy. Oh, this thing over here. Well, I've heard that this is going to be great. You know, I'll just give it a whirl because it seems easy and it's laid out for you and such and such has done it and she lost loads of weight. And so it seems like it might work for you. That seems like the easier option than really just, you know, spending the money, figuring it out, finding a mentor, you know, all of those things, which actually are a little more effort. This one just seems easier. And as human beings, we usually just choose the choose the easiest path. That's what human beings do. We just choose the easiest path. And so um, no judgment here. I choose the easiest path too. But that is usually the reasons that we do it. So what should you do instead? Okay, let's just to bring just to sum it all up. Here's what you should do rather than jumping on the, you know, the fad diet, fad, the, 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 the fad diet uh, bandwagon. Here's actually what you should do instead. Okay, so you need number one, time your nutrients around your training. So your muscles are getting fed when they need it the most. Okay, don't cut out whole macro groups, eat your protein and your carbs before and after training, eat your protein throughout the day so that, you know, your muscles are constantly getting a supply of amino acids and don't cut out groups. Just be smarter, okay? More intelligent with your timing. Number two, eat 30 grams of protein within 30 to 60 minutes of waking up to ramp up your metabolism. Do not keep your metabolism depressed, okay? You do not want to depress your metabolism because that would not be a good thing to do. When you wake up in the morning, your metabolism is slow. You want to speed that bitch up, okay? You want to you want to like stick a hot poker up her ass and get her going so that she can burn more calories for you, okay? If that is your goal to burn more calories, then you're not doing your body any good by keeping your metabolism slow and depressed until lunchtime. Um, number three, work out an eating plan that is sustainable for you, okay? D something that you enjoy. Don't force yourself to eat food that you don't enjoy, Figure out what you enjoy and work it into your work it into your diet, okay? And make sure you're eating five times a day to stave off hunger. Whenever I diet, even when I'm right down to twelve or thirteen hundred calories, I I eat five times a day so that every time I'm hungry again, it's time to eat another meal. So it's not like you're, you know, you're holding your cramping stomach. Like how many times have you gone to bed hungry and you're like, oh my God, I can't sleep because you're so fecking hungry. And when you're starving, you can't sleep. So I always make sure that I hold off and hold off and hold off and time my last meal of the day just before I go to bed, which is always a protein shake. And then I feel full going to bed and I'm, you know, and then I can sleep. And sleep is very important, especially when you're dieting. Number four, you want to make sure you have a refeed or a cheat meal every week with lots of food and drink. Even two days won't cause much damage if you're strict during the week. Whenever I did a 10-week shred there before going to Australia um, at Christmas, I, I it was coming up to, to Christmas time, so there were loads of parties to go to, and I had so much alcohol on the weekends, like not every single weekend, but there were so many weekends that I was at parties, or Ryan and I had nights out planned in Belfast or whatever, and and you know I just let it go, and I just ate, and I drank, but I was, I was good. You know, I stayed on diet, you you know, five days a week. And I sat on diet for most of the day during the weekend. But I went out and I ate and I drank that night. I had two, two nights off almost every single weekend. And I was shredded by the time we went to Australia. So the more relaxed you are and, the, you know, the more you give yourself what it is that your body's craving, the, the better you'll feel mentally and physically. Number five, the last one, train hard. Most people just don't train hard hard enough. Somebody wrote to me the other day and said, can I do my glute bridges on the uh, leg extension machine? And I was like, uh, why would you do this? And she said, oh, because it's much easier than having to set up, you know, the, the thing. And I was like, no. And I said to her, because the, it's, you just don't go heavy enough. I said, like, my leg extension machine at the gym, I lift full stack, okay, but on leg extensions, and it's 100 kilos. And I said, you just can't, you just can't go heavy enough. She was like, oh, well, that's okay, because my top set's only, like, 60 kilos. And I was like, if your top set in a glute bridge is 60 kilos and you're not progressing past that, you're not working hard enough. My top set in glute bridges um, in or hip thrusts, sorry, in the gym is 300 kilos, which is 660 pounds. Okay. That is how you build muscle. I'm not saying that you should be lifting 300 kilos, but you certainly should be lifting heavier than 60. And if you're not, you ain't training hard enough. If you are able to, if you're injured, that's different. But if you're able to, you should be lifting more. You need to focus on building muscle and find cardio that you enjoy doing. What cardio do I do? I walk on the Stairmaster. Do I enjoy walking on the Stairmaster? 
No, but you know what I enjoy doing? Checking out all of my groups, answering emails, writing posts, and watching Netflix. That's what I do while I'm the Stairmaster, and I do enjoy doing that. So I just move while I'm doing it. I also walk on the treadmill and I walk outside. I actually asked Courtney, Courtney, my assistant, to find me a treadmill for the office. So I said to her, get me a treadmill for the office and get someone to build me a shelf just above the treadmill so I can set my computer on it, which means I can have all of my meetings and walk at the same time. She was like, that's genius. I was like, I know. So now whenever I'm in the office and I sometimes I have, you know, three times a week, I have quite a lot of meetings with my team who are worldwide. So I'm just going to walk on the treadmill while I'm having the meeting and I'm burning calories while I'm working. Okay. Do I enjoy doing it? No, but it's a good way to pass the time while I'm having meetings and I want to, you know, burn body fat and keep myself fit. So figure right away that you can achieve your goal that, you know, but you don't even really know that you're doing it. There's always ways to achieve your goal. You just have to be creative. You just have to be creative. And, you know, and lastly, I guess what I want to say to you is you need to train yourself to feel better if you do the thing, no matter how hard, than if you don't, okay? You have to commit to the process. Whenever I'm training legs in the gym with Mark, I start to feel sick on a Monday night and and I just in dread of it. Whenever I wake up on Tuesday morning, I go, oh my God, it's legs. And then we drive to the gym. I'm like, oh my God, it's legs. And then we get to the gym, I'm like, oh my God, it's legs. And it's really only two sets that are the killer. Like I have two sets that are an absolute fucker, right? Uh, one is a is a squat, a V squat, where I squat about 160, 180 kilos. And the other one is an incline hack squat. Really just for literally two minutes of my entire session, it's really, 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 really hard. And actually, we put up some videos recently on YouTube of my training sessions. Um, so I'll definitely link to those and let you know where to go find them. Um, but anyway, I digress. What I'm saying is I I go train and every week I go, oh, I'm not going to train like so. I'm just not going to train like so. I'm going to give myself a week off. And I tell myself I'm going to give myself a week off. And then I imagine how I will feel after I have given myself a week off. And I go, no not going to give myself a week off because I know what will happen because I'll feel worse having given myself the week off than I would do than just showing up and getting under that squat bar and just doing the hard thing. Now, of course, sometimes I take deload weeks, I take rest weeks or whatever. But, you know, if I'm just wanting to let myself off the hook, uh, you know, I never do because I know I'll feel worse afterwards. But that comes from years of training. You have to train yourself to feel worse after you don't do the thing than when you do do the thing. And that is how you build long-term sustainable habits. And that is ultimately how you change your body forever. It doesn't come from slapping the bandaid on. It doesn't come from the quick fix. It doesn't come from, you know, the fad diets. It comes from the non-sexy stuff that nobody wants to do, but that truly is the only way that anyone has ever achieved greatness in their lives. It's how I built a multi-million dollar fitness empire, some people have called it these days. I'm like, ooh, I like that. I have an empire. But, you know, it's how I built my business. It's how I built my body. It's how I trained my dogs. It's how I have such an incredible relationship with my husband. I could have divorced him so many times, but we don't. We go to marriage counseling once a week with my coach in America. And, you know, we we show up every week. And is it, it do we enjoy it? No, well, actually, I enjoy it more than, more than he does. Because I just get to tell him all the things he's done wrong. But, um, you know, so we are committed. To, ha to having a really fantastic relationship. The easier thing would have been just to separate years ago when times were hard and kids were young and emotions were high and he, you know, give me no back and help around the house or with the kids or whatever, but we didn't. We soldiered through and here we are now stronger than I, we have ever been in our entire lives. But the only reason why we are stronger, I am stronger physically, mentally, emotionally, financially, is because I didn't give up. And I didn't look for the quick fix and I didn't look for the quick get rich quick scheme. And I didn't look to make a quick buck and I didn't look to, you know, have a, you know, have a quick shag. <laughs> well, actually I did. <laughs> That's why I married my husband in the first place. I got pregnant very quickly. <laughs> but anyway, uh, luckily we were very well suited and we're still married many years later. But I wasn't looking for the quick fix. I was looking for the long-term sustainable solution because that's truly the only thing that works. So I would encourage you to do the same. It's boring. It's not sexy. And, you know, but it is entirely necessary. I was trying to finish with a really profound thing to say there. Kind of just fell, fell flat on its face. Just kind of, you know, like the information I'm giving you. It ain't sexy. There's really no way to code it to make it sound better. You just got to show up, do the work, do it consistently, stop looking for the quick fix or the fad. And, you know, you'll, you'll get the results if you stick with it. I promise. <laughs>
Okay, so thank you so much for listening. I know that episode went on quite long, but you know, I really enjoyed recording it and I think it was worth saying um, all the information. And I know it's stuff that I say time and time and time and time and time again. It's like, you know, how many times can you deliver the information? But, you know, I think my message is very consistent. Uh, and I and I do believe that I have the, the proof to pack it up, you know, to back it up. I have achieved, you know, in my 41 years, especially in the last three, four years, whenever I really focused hard, I've achieved an incredible amount, both personally and professionally. And so, you know, I, I think I have earned the right to teach you what is necessary. And I hope that you guys enjoy these podcasts. And even if you don't always apply the information, I hope that you feel inspired after listening to them because I truly, truly enjoy recording them. Um, Don't forget to leave that review on iTunes or wherever you're listening to this podcast. Send me a screenshot as a DM. You could win one of our programs next month. And I will speak to you next week for another episode of the Strong and Sculpted podcast. Have an absolutely awesome and epic week wherever you are. And I will talk to you very, very soon. Thank you.